Hi, everyone. Before we start our episode on Helen Keller, just wanted to touch base to see how people are doing, how you're doing today. Um, been receiving a lot of prayer requests. Uh, there's a lot of hurting people um, and people going through a lot of things um, right now. So I just want to let you know you're not alone. Um, reach out to me at Mindset Matters Podcast One. That's the number one, not O-N-E, uh, at gmail.com. And um, you can just reach out if you have a prayer request or just want to touch base with someone so that you're not feeling alone. Um, please do. I, I check that email daily. Um, I enjoyed researching for this episode on Helen Keller. Uh, what an inspiration. Um, someone who was dealt a really tough hand. She was born healthy and then through an illness became blind and deaf. Um, and instead of letting that be um, her woe is me story, she turned it around and really led quite an extraordinary life. So um, I hope you enjoy the episode today and, and take away that what we focus on grows if we focus on our problems and what we don't have um, and give energy to it, that's going to grow and, and become overwhelming. But if we focus on our blessings and what we do have, um, we start to have gratitude and hope and joy. So on to our episode. Step into the extraordinary world of Helen Keller, a woman whose indomitable spirit soared beyond the constraints of blindness and deafness. In this episode, we unravel the layers of her remarkable life, exploring the triumphs, challenges, and the profound legacy she left on the world. Join us as we delve into the inspiring journey of a woman who transformed adversity into triumph, proving that even in silence and darkness, one can find the brilliance of a shining soul. Welcome to Mindset Matters, the courage to continue, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary lives of ordinary individuals who have overcome immense challenges and emerged as beacons of inspiration. I'm your host, Lisa Sinclair, and today we embark on a remarkable journey into the life of one such individual. This is episode 21, The Courage to Find Joy in Overcoming Obstacles, The Hero Heart of Helen Keller. Known globally as a symbol of courage and hope, Helen Keller transcends mere recognition as a name or an emblem. Her legacy is deeply woven with astounding intelligence, unyielding determination, extraordinary courage, and unparalleled achievements. Throughout her life, she devoted herself to the improvement of others, empowering individuals to recognize the potential within themselves and the world around them. A trailblazer from an early age, Helen Keller achieved the remarkable feat of becoming the first blind and deaf person to effectively communicate with the sighted and hearing world. This groundbreaking achievement catapulted her into international celebrity status at the tender age of eight years old, an era predating the widespread advent of mass communications. Beyond the symbol she became, Helen Keller's life is a testament to the transformative power of resilience, intellect, and the unwavering pursuit of a better world for all. Born into the heart of Tuscumbia, Alabama, on June 27, 1880, Helen Keller emerged into a world filled with both challenges and possibilities. The daughter of Arthur Henley Keller and Catherine Everett Keller, affectionately known as Kate, she grew up in the embrace of Ivy Green, a homestead constructed by her paternal grandfather years before. There, Helen lived with her two siblings, Mildred Campbell Tyson and Philip Brooks Keller, as well as her half-brothers from her father's previous marriage, James MacDonald Keller and William Simpson Keller. After a normal birth and healthy infancy, in a faithful twist at just 19 months of age, Helen encountered a mysterious ailment, 
a medical enigma characterized by physicians as, quote, an acute congestion of the stomach and the brain, end quote. Due to the high fever, modern medical perspectives suggest it could have been the ominous specter of meningitis or scarlet fever. This illness resulted in the loss of sight and hearing for Helen and resulted in a difficulty with her speech development in her early childhood years. In those early years, Helen Keller found a bridge to communication through a remarkable connection with Martha Washington, a two years older companion and the daughter of the family's cook. Through Martha's expressive signs, Keller began to navigate the realm of understanding. By the tender age of seven, Helen had crafted a lexicon of over 60 home signs, a silent language that wove the fabric of connection within her family. Intriguingly, she developed the uncanny ability to identify individuals not by sight or sound, but by the distinctive vibrations of their footsteps. In 1886, Helen's mother, inspired by the triumphant tale of Laura Bridgman in Charles Dickens' American Notes, took a bold step. Determined to unlock her daughter's potential, she sent Helen and her father on a journey to consult with Dr. J. Julian Chisholm, a specialist in eyes, ears, nose, and throat in Baltimore. Dr. Chisholm, in turn, directed the Kellers to none other than Alexander Graham Bell, then deeply immersed in his work with deaf children. Following Bell's counsel, the Kellers reached out to the Perkins Institute for the Blind, a renowned institution located in South Boston. The director, Michael Anagos, recognizing the parallels with Laura Bridgman's success, enlisted the expertise of Anne Sullivan. A 20-year-old alumna of the school and visually impaired herself, Sullivan stepped into the role of Helen's instructor, setting the stage for a remarkable relationship that spanned nearly five decades. Their backgrounds couldn't have been more disparate. Anne, raised in the challenging circumstances of being the daughter of impoverished Irish immigrants, her early years were marked by hardship. At the age of 14, after enduring four challenging years as a ward of the state, she found herself at Perkins, embarking on a path that would later intersect with Helen's. Remarkably close in age, a mere 15 years separated Anne from her pupil Helen. Their bond deepened further as they shared a common struggle with serious vision impairments. Anne, too, faced the challenges of vision problems and underwent numerous unsuccessful operations during her youth before experiencing a partial restoration of her sight. The parallels in their journeys created a unique connection that transcended teacher and pupil, forging a profound understanding between two individuals who had navigated challenging paths to arrive at a shared destination. On March 5, 1887, Anne Sullivan stepped into Helen Keller's world, marking the beginning of a transformative journey, etched into Keller's memory as her, quote, soul's birthday, end quote. Sullivan, armed with determination and a doll as a starting point, embarked on the task of unraveling the enigma of communication with the young Helen, who could not see nor hear. Initiating the process, Sullivan spelled out D-O-L-L into Keller's hand, initiating a method that would forever alter the course of Keller's life. However, grasping the concept proved a daunting challenge for Helen, who struggled to fathom that every object held a unique word tethered to it. The frustration reached a breaking point when, in an attempt to teach the word mug, Keller, overwhelmed, shattered the very object in her hands. However, Helen was not one to let trials defeat her. After many attempts, a breakthrough emerged. Helen, in her own words, recounted how she began mimicking Sullivan's hand gestures, unknowingly engaging in a monkey-like imitation. One morning at the water pump, 
Anne Sullivan held Helen's hands under the cool water, repeatedly signing W-A-T-E-R into Helen's hand. Immersed in the mesmerizing dance of her teacher's fingers, Helen stood still, captivated by the motions. Then, she says, like a whisper from the depths of forgotten realms, a misty consciousness enveloped me, a surge of returning thought. In that transcendent moment, the enigma of language unfurled before me. I grasped with unbridled clarity that W-A-T-E-R signified the wondrous cool essence flowing over my hand. The connection was made. The living word breathed life into my soul, casting aside shadows, illuminating hope, and setting my spirit free. In the wake of her transformative revelation, Helen wasted no time in unleashing her newfound understanding. Brimming with curiosity and determination, she insisted that Anne divulge the names of every familiar object that adorned her world, a demand that echoed her hunger for knowledge and connection. This opened the world to Helen, and she spent the next few years learning basic things and how to interact with family and friends around her. In 1894, Keller and Sullivan ventured boldly into the bustling city of New York. They went to the Wright Humison School for the Deaf. Simultaneously, they sought the guidance of Sarah Fuller at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf, adding new dimensions to Keller's educational odyssey. After a brief return to Massachusetts in 1896, Keller stepped into the Cambridge School for Young Ladies before securing a coveted spot at Radcliffe College at Harvard University in 1900. Embarking on a literary journey at the tender age of 22, Helen Keller unveiled her life's narrative in the captivating autobiography called The Story of My Life, written in 1903. Collaborating with her lifelong companions, Anne Sullivan and Sullivan's husband, John Macy, Keller's memoir delves into the adventures and challenges of her remarkable journey, capturing the essence of her experiences up to the age of 21. Helen continued to write and penned an influential article in 1907, thrusting a critical issue into the public eye. Her focus? The Preventable Tragedy of Childhood Blindness. Keller illuminated the importance of washing newborn's eyes with a disinfectant solution, a simple yet neglected practice at the time. In the wake of Keller's advocacy, this sensible public health measure swiftly gained traction, reshaping practices and safeguarding countless young lives. 1908 brought forth another captivating revelation with the publication of Helen's The World I Live In. Through the lens of Keller's words, readers were granted a profound glimpse into her unique perspective and the kaleidoscope of emotions that colored her perception of the world. A literary journey that transcended the boundaries of sight and sound, this work became a portal into Keller's inner landscape. In 1913, Helen penned Out of the Dark, a collection of essays that delved into the complexities of socialism. Through her elegant prose, Keller offered readers a nuanced exploration of societal structures and ideologies. Helen's interest in socialism and her activism provided a surprising twist in her 30s. She found herself entangled in a love affair, kindling a secret engagement that defied the expectations of her teacher and family. The object of her affection was none other than the fingerspelling socialist Peter Fagan, an enterprising Boston Herald reporter dispatched to Helen's home as a private secretary during Anne Sullivan's illness. However, amid the loss of Helen's father and her beloved Anne Sullivan, she did not marry, but continued her life as an activist for disability rights. Sadly, in 1936, Helen found herself holding Anne Sullivan's hand as she slipped into an eternal slumber, 
the result of a heart-wrenching coma caused by coronary thrombosis. Following this heart-rending loss, Keller met Polly Thompson and embarked on a new chapter, transporting their lives to the scenic landscapes of Connecticut. Polly Thompson, a spirited young woman hailing from Scotland, stepped into the role of housekeeper, despite having no prior experience with individuals who were deaf or blind. A tale of unexpected synergy unfolded as Polly, initially unfamiliar with Keller's world, transitioned from housekeeping to a secretarial role. Remarkably, she seamlessly became a constant presence and confidant in Keller's life. Their journey unfolded as a globe-trotting escapade where Keller and Thompson traversed the world, not merely as spectators, but as tireless advocates, raising funds and awareness for the blind. However, fate dealt another blow in 1957 when Thompson, after suffering a debilitating stroke, never fully recovered and eventually passed away in 1960. Enter Winnie Corbally, a compassionate nurse initially hired to care for Thompson in 1957. Instead of bowing out after Thompson's demise, Corbally chose to remain, becoming Keller's steadfast companion until the end of her remarkable life. Over the years, Helen Keller emerged not just as a speaker and author, but as a fervent advocate, championing a multitude of causes with passion and purpose. Her advocacy extended far beyond the realm of disability rights as she crisscrossed the globe, delivering stirring speeches in 25 countries that shed light on the challenges faced by deaf and blind individuals. In addition to advocating for disabled individuals, Helen was a trailblazer on multiple fronts. She lent her voice to the suffrage movement, embraced pacifism, championed radical socialist ideals, ardently supported birth control, and stood in opposition to none other than Woodrow Wilson himself. In a momentous partnership in 1915, Keller and George A. Kessler laid the foundation for the Helen Keller International Organization, a beacon dedicated to pioneering research in the fields of vision, health, and nutrition. In the twilight of her journey, Helen Keller faced a series of strokes in 1961, Retreating to the sanctuary of her home, she spent her final years at Arkin Ridge in eastern Connecticut, where the echoes of her impactful legacy reverberated. In 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson bestowed upon her the prestigious Presidential Medal of Freedom, an accolade that illuminated the profound impact of her advocacy. In 1965, she earned a well-deserved place in the National Women's Hall of Fame at the New York World's Fair. On June 1, 1968, Helen Keller peacefully departed in her sleep, just a few weeks shy of her 88th birthday. A solemn service unfolded at the Washington National Cathedral. Helen Keller's remarkable journey from Tuscumbia, Alabama to global acclaim stands as an inspirational narrative, a trajectory that led her from the depths of silence and darkness to a life defined by vision and advocacy. Confronting formidable challenges, she undertook what appeared to be an insurmountable battle to reclaim the world she had lost. In doing so, she emerged as one of the most potent symbols of triumph over adversity in our era earning the esteemed acknowledgement from Winston Churchill, who hailed her as, quote, the greatest woman of our age, end quote. Here are some quotes from speeches Helen gave. Quote, I want you to remember that blind children and grown-up blind people have feelings like you and want the same things that you do. They want friends, they want to play, and they want to go to school and learn to be of some use in the world. Unless somebody helps them, they will be unhappy and discontented, just as you would be if nobody cared about you. End quote. Here's another speech. Quote, you have heard how I was taught how a little word 
dropped from the fingers of another, a ray of light from another soul touched the darkness of my mind, and I awoke to the sunshine of beauty and life. It was my teacher that gave me eyes and ears within my limitations, and opened the doors of opportunity and friendship for me. End quote. I am so often asked to bring a message of encouragement to the unfortunate. I fear I overstress the thought that suffering is important to our spiritual development. Through suffering, we may grow strong and overcome difficulties that we should otherwise not have had courage to encounter. End quote. And lastly, quote, Sometimes people would ask me, What gives you the courage to go on? I answer, The Bible, poetry, and philosophy. When they ask, How do you feel when God seems to desert you? I answer, I have never had that feeling. End quote. Please enjoy the following audio clip where you'll hear Ann Sullivan describe and demonstrate how she taught Helen Keller to feel speech. Ann Sullivan. When I saw Helen Keller first, she was six years and eight months old. She had been blind and deaf and mute since her 19th month as the result of an illness. She had no way of communicating with those around her except a few imitative signs that she had uh, made for herself. A push man go and a pull man come and so on. She had observed that we did not use the hands when we were talking to each other. And I let her see by putting her hand on my face Helen places her open hand over Anne's face. She felt the vibration of the spoken word. Instantly, she spelled, I want to talk with my mouth. Helen smiles. That seemed impossible. But after experimenting for a time, we found that placing her hand in this position the thumb resting on the throat, right at the larynx, the first finger on the lips, the second on the nose, we found that she could feel the vibration of spoken words. For instance, the throat, she feels the G, the hard G, G. And on the lips... Helen repeats after Anne. The K sign. On the lips, she feels the uh, B, and the t and the, with the second finger on the nose, the nasal sounds, the n, mm, the n. Mm. The first word she learned to articulate was the little word it. With the hand in this position, I made the vowel I. Mm. She felt it. I. Mm. Then I made the T. <laughs> she feels it with the finger on her lips. On my lips. Mm. Then I put the two letters together to form the word. I. Mm. And the first word was learned. And smiles. After her seventh lesson, she was able to speak the sentence word by word, I, I am um, not, not dumb, dumb now. No. Helen smiles. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and found it inspiring. Uh, my big takeaway was um, that in my readings about Helen Keller, I never came across anything where she... Um, became very depressed and discouraged and kind of um, pity party-ish about the fact that she became sick and lost her um, sight and her hearing. And I just admired that instead of focusing on what she lost, she focused on how she was going to overcome it. And I find that very inspirational. 
Um, if you would like to check out our website, please go over to Mindset Matters Podcast One dot com. And there you'll find a blog that has pictures that go with the episodes. And you'll also have ways of interacting, including leading, leaving a voicemail or um, your address if you would like to receive a newsletter. I hope you'll join us for the next episode, which is going to be on the hero hearts of firefighters. Hope to see you then. Thank you for giving your time to listen to this episode of Mindset Matters, The Courage to Continue. You are of value. You are loved. You are not alone. If you are struggling with thoughts of suicide, help is available. Dial 988 24 hours a day for free confidential support. If you are not in crisis but need support, please feel free to reach out to me at the email Mindset Matters Podcast numeral one at gmail.com. Again, that's all lowercase Mindset Matters Podcast the numeral one at gmail.com. Remember to change your day by what you think and say. We'll see you next time.